Chapter Four of Gladiator. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gladiator by Philip Wiley. Chapter Four. Days, months, years. They had forgotten that Hugo was different. Almost for a while he had forgotten it himself. He was popular in school. He fostered the unexpressed theory that his strength had been a phenomena of his childhood, one that diminished as he grew older. Then at ten it called to him for exercise. Each day he rose with a feeling of insufficiency. Each night he retired unrequited. He read Poe, the Bible, Scott, Thackeray, Swift, Defoe, all the books he could find. He thrilled with every syllable of adventure. His imagination swelled, but that was not sufficient. He yearned as a New England boy yearns before he runs away to sea. At ten, he was a stalwart and handsome lad. His brow was high and surmounted by his peculiarly black hair. His eyes were wide apart, inky, unfathomable. He carried himself with the grace of an athlete. He studied hard, and he worked hard for his parents, taking care of a cow and chickens, of a stable and a large lawn, of flowers, and a vegetable garden. Then one day he went by himself to walk in the mountains. He had not been allowed to go into the mountains alone. A wanderlust had come, half from himself and half from his books, led his feet along a narrow leafy trail into the forest depths. Hugo lay down and listened to the birds in the bushes, to the music of a brook, and to the sound of the wind. He wanted to be free and brave and great. By and by he stood up and walked again. An easy exhilaration filled his veins. His pace increased. I wonder, he thought, how fast I can run, how far I can jump. He quickened his stride. In a moment he found that the turns in the trail were too frequent for him to see his course. He ran ahead, realizing that he was moving at an abnormal pace. Then he turned, gathered himself, and jumped carefully. He was astonished when he vaulted above the green covering of the trail. He came down heavily. He stood in his tracks, tingling. Nobody can do that, not even an acrobat, he whispered. Again he tried, jumping straight up. He rose fully forty feet in the air. Good Jesus, he exulted. In those lonely, incredible moments, Hugo found himself. There in the forest, beyond the eye of man, he learned that he was superhuman. It was a rapturous discovery. He knew at that hour that his strength was not a curse. He had inklings of his invulnerability. He ran. He shot up the steep trail like an express train at a rate that would have been measured in miles to the hour rather than yards to the minute. Tireless blood poured through his veins. Green streaked at his sides. In a short time he came to the end of the trail. He plunged on, careless of obstacles that would have stopped an ordinary mortal. From trunk to trunk he leaped a burn stretch. He flung himself from a high rock. He sped like a shadow across a pine-carpeted knoll. He gained the bare rocks of the first mountain, and in the open, where the horror of no eye would tether his strength, he moved in flying bounds to its summit. Hugo stood there panting. Below him was the world, a little world. He laughed. His dreams had been broken open. His depression was relieved, but he would never let them know. He, Hugo the giant, except perhaps his father, he lifted his arms to thank God, to jeer at the world. Hugo was happy. He went home wondering. He was very hungry, hungrier than he had ever been, and his parents watched him eat with hidden glances. Samson had eaten thus, as if his stomach were bottomless, and his food digested instantly to make room for more. And as he ate, Hugo tried to open a conversation that would lead to a confession to his father, but it seemed impossible. Hugo liked his father. He saw how his mother dominated the little professor, how she seemed to have crushed and bewildered him until his mind was unfocused from its present. He could not love his mother because of that. He did not reason that her religion had made her blind and selfish, but he felt her blindness and the many cloaks that protected her and her interests. He held her in respect, and he obeyed her, but often and wistfully 
he had tried to talk to his father, to make friends with him, to make himself felt as a person. Abednego Danner's mind was buried in the work he had done. His son was a foreign person for whom he felt a perplexed sympathy. It is significant that he had never talked to Hugo about Hugo's prowess. The ten-year-old boy had not wished to discuss it. Now, however, realizing its extent, he felt he must go to his father. After dinner, he said, Dad, let's you and me take a walk. Mrs. Danner's protective impulses functioned automatically. Not tonight. I won't have it. But, Mother, Danner guessed the reason for that walk. He said to his wife with rare firmness, If the boy wants to walk with me, we're going. After supper they went out. Mrs. Danner felt that she had been shut out of her own son's world, and she realized that he was growing up. Danner and his son strolled along the leafy street. They talked about his work in school. His father seemed to Hugo more human than he had ever been. He even ventured the first step toward other conversation. Well, son, what is it? Hugo caught his breath. Well, I kind of thought I ought to tell you. Y you see, this afternoon, well, you know, I've always been a sort of strong kid. Danner trembled. I know. And you haven't said much about it to me except to be gentle. That's so. You must remember it. Well, I don't have to be gentle with myself, do I? When I'm alone, like in the woods, that is. The older one pondered. You mean you like to, uh, let yourself out when you're alone? That's what I mean. The usual constraint between them had receded. Hugo was grateful for his father's help. You see, Dad, I, well, I went walking today, and I, I kind of tried myself out. Danner answered in breathless eagerness. And? Well, I'm not just a strong kid, Dad. I don't know what's the matter with me. It seems I'm not like other kids at all. I guess it's been getting worse all these years since I was a baby. Worse? I mean, I've been getting stronger. And now it seems like I'm about, well, I don't like to boast, but it seems like I'm about the strongest man in the world. When I try it, it seems like there isn't any stopping me. I can go on far as I like, running, jumping. His confession had commenced in detail. Hugo warmed to it. I can do things, Dad. It kind of scares me. I can jump higher in a house. I can run faster in a train. I can pull up big trees and push them over. I see. Danner's spine tingled. He worshipped his son then. Suppose you show me. Hugo looked up and down the street. There was no one in sight. The evening was still duskily lighted by afterglow. Look out, then. I'm going to jump. Mr. Danner saw his son crouch. But he jumped so quickly that he vanished. Four seconds elapsed. He landed where he had stood. See, Dad? Do it again. On the second trial, the professor's eyes followed the soaring form, and he realized the magnitude of the thing he had wrought. Did you see me? Danner nodded. I saw you, son. Kind of funny, isn't it? Let's talk some more. There was a pause. Do you realize, son, that no one else on earth can do what you just did? Yeah, I guess not. Danner hesitated. It's a glorious thing, and dangerous. Yeah. The professor tried to simplify the biology of his discovery. He perceived that it was going to involve him in the mysteries of sex. He knew that to unfold them to a child was considered immoral. But Danner was far, far beyond his epoch. He put his hands on Hugo's shoulder, and Hugo set off the process. Dad! How come I'm like this? I'll tell you. It's a long story, and a lot for a boy your age to know. First, what do you know about, well, about how you were born? Hugo reddened. I, I guess I know quite a bit. The kids in school are always talking about it, and I've read some. We're born like, well, like the kittens were born last year. That's right. Banner knitted his brow. He began to explain the details of conception as it occurs in man, the biology of ova and spermatozoa, the differences between the anatomy of the sexes and the reasons for those differences. He drew first a botanical analogy. Hugo listened intently. I knew most of that. I've seen girls. What? Some of them after school let you. Dana was surprised. And at the same time he was amused. He had forgotten the details of his young investigation. 
they are blotted out of the minds of most adults to the great advantage of dignity he did not show his amusement or his surprise girls like that he answered aren't very nice they haven't much modesty it's rather indecent because sex is a personal thing and something you ought to keep for the one you're very fond of you'll understand that better when you're older but what i was going to tell you is this when you were little more than a mass of plasm inside your mother i put a medicine in her blood that i had discovered i did it with a hypodermic needle that medicine changed you it altered the structure of your bones and muscles and nerves and your blood it made you into a different tissue from the weak fiber of ordinary people then when you were born you were strong did you ever watch an ant carry many times its weight or see a grasshopper jump fifty times its length the insects have better muscles and nerves than we have and i improved your body till it was relatively that strong can you understand that sure i'm like a man made out of iron instead of meat that's it hugo and as you grow up you've got to remember that you're not an ordinary human being when people find that out they'll 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 hate me because they fear you so you see you've got to be good and kind and considerate to justify all that strength some day you'll find a use for it a big noble use and then you can make it work and be proud of it until that day you have to be humble like all the rest of us you mustn't show off or do cheap tricks then you would just be a clown wait your time son and you'll be glad of it and another thing train your temper you must never lose it you can see what would happen if you did understand i guess i do it's hard work doing all that the stronger the greater you are the harder life is for you and you're the strongest of them all hugo the heart of the ten-year-old boy burned and vibrated and what about god he asked danner looked into the darkened sky i don't know much about him he sighed such was the soundest counsel that hugo was given during his youth because it came to him accompanied by unadulterated truths that he was able to recognize it exerted a profound effect on him it is surprising that his father was the one to give it nevertheless professor danner was the only person in all of indian creek who had sufficient imagination to perceive his son's problems and to reckon with them in any practical sense hugo was eighteen before he gave any other indication of his strength save in that fantastic and gargantuan play which he permitted himself even his play was intruded upon by the small-minded and curious world before he had found the completeness of its pleasure then hugo fell into his coma hugo went back to the deep forest to think things over and to become acquainted with his powers at first under full pressure of his sinews he was clumsy and inaccurate he learned deftness by trial and error one day he found a huge pit in the tangled wilderness it had been an open mine long years before sitting on its brink staring into its pool of verdure dreaming he conceived a manner of entertainment suitable for his powers he jumped over its craggy edge and walked to its center there he selected a high place and with his hands he cleared away the growth that covered it next he laid the foundations of a fort over which he was to watch the fastnesses for imaginary enemies the foundations were made of boulders some he carried and some he rolled from the floor of the man-made canyon by the end of the afternoon he had laid out a square wall of rock some three feet in height on the next day he added to it until the four walls reached as high as he could stretch he left space for one door and he made a single window he roofed the walls with the trunks of trees and he erected a turret over the door for days the creation was his delight after school he sped to it until dark he strained and struggled with bare rocks when it was finished it was an edifice that would have withstood artillery fire creditably then hugo experimented with catapults but he found no engine that could hurl the rocks he used for ammunition as far as his arms he cached his treasures in his fortress an old axe the scabbard of a sword tops and marbles two cans of beans for emergency rations and he made a flag of blue and white cloth for himself then he played in it 
He pretended that Indians were stalking him. An imaginary head would appear at the rim of the pit. Hugo would see it through a chink. Swish! Crash! A puff of dust would show where rock met rock, with the attacker's head between. At times he would be stormed on all sides, and to get the effect he would leap the canyon and hurl boulders on his own fort. Then he would return and defend it. It was after such a strenuous sally, and while he was waiting in high excitement for the enemy to reappear, that Professors Whitaker and Smith, from the college, stumbled onto his stronghold. They were walking together through the forest, bent on scaling the mountain to make certain observations of an ancient cirque that was formed by the seventh great glacier. As they walked, they debated matters of strata curvature. Suddenly Whitaker gripped Smith's arm. Look! They stared through the trees and over the lip of Hugo's mine. Their eyes bulged as they observed the size and weight of the fortress. Moonshiners, Smith whispered. Rubbish. Moonshiners don't build like that. It's a second Stonehenge, an Indian relic. But there's a sign of fresh work around it. Whitaker observed the newly turned earth and the freshly bared rock. Perhaps, perhaps, Professor, we've fallen upon something big. A lost race of Indian engineers, a branch of the Incas, or maybe they'll be hostile. The men edged forward, and at the moment they reached the edge of the pit, Hugo emerged from his fort. He saw the men with sudden fear. He tried to hide. Hey, they said. He did not move, but he heard them scrambling slowly toward the spot where he lay. Dressed in civilized clothes, the first professor said in a loud voice as his eye located Hugo in the underbrush. Hey! Hugo showed himself. What? Who are you? Hugo Danner. Oh, old Danner's boy, eh? Hugo did not like the tone in which they referred to his father. He made no reply. Can you tell us anything about these ruins? What ruins? They pointed to his fort. Hugo was hurt. Those aren't ruins. I built that fort. It's to fight Indians in. The pair ignored his answer and started toward the fort. Hugo did not protest. They surveyed its weighty walls and its relatively new roof. Looks recent, Smith said. This child has evidently renovated it, but it must have stood here for thousands of years. It didn't. I made it mostly last week. They noticed him again. Whitaker simpered. Don't lie, young man. Hugo was sad. I'm not lying. I made it. You see, I'm strong. It was as if he had pronounced his own damnation. Tut, tut, Smith interrupted his survey. Did you find it? I built it. I said, the professor spoke with increasing annoyance, I said not to tell me stories any longer. It's important, young man, that we know just how you found this dolman and in what condition. It isn't a dolly, whatever you said. It's a fort, and I built it, and I'm not lying. The professor, in the interest of science, made a grave mistake. He seized Hugo by the arms and shook him. Now see here, young man, I'll have no more of your impertinent lip. Just tell me what you've done to harm this noble monument to another race, or I swear I'll slap you properly. The professor had no children. He tried at the same time another tack, which insulted Hugo further. If you do, I'll give you a penny to keep. Hugo wrenched himself free with an ease that startled Smith. His face was dark, almost black. He spoke slowly, as if he was trying to piece words into sense. You, both of you. You go away from here and leave me, or I'll break your two rotten old necks. Whitaker moved toward him, and Smith interceded. We better leave him and come back later. He was still frightened by the strength in Hugo's arms. The child is mad. He may have hydrophobia. He might bite. The men moved away hastily. Hugo watched them climb the wall. When they reached the top, he called gently. They wheeled, and Hugo, sobbing, Tears streaming from his face leaped into his fort. Rocks vomited themselves from it, huge rocks that no man could budge. Walls toppled and crashed. The men began to move. Hugo looked up. He chose a stone that weighed more than a hundred pounds. Hey, he said, I'm not a liar. The rock arched through the air, and Professors Whitaker and Smith escaped death by a scant margin. Hugo lay in the wreck of the first thing his hands had built and wept. After a little while he sprang to his feet and chased the retreating professors. When he suddenly appeared in front of them, they were stricken dumb. 
Don't tell anyone about that or about me, he said. If you do, I'll break down your house just like I broke mine. Don't even tell my family. They know it anyhow. He leaped toward them, over them. The forest hid him. Whitaker wiped clammy perspiration from his brow. What was it, Smith? A demon. We can't mention it, he repeated, thinking of the warning. We can't speak of it anyway. They'll never believe us. End of chapter 4